Have you ever had someone say to you that baptism is not necessary for salvation? That's what we're going to talk about today on Answering the Error. We hope you'll stay tuned. Hi, I'm Don Blackwell, and this is Aaron Gallagher. We would like to welcome you to a brand new program on the Gospel Broadcasting Network. It is called Answering the Error. On this series, we will be taking videos that we have found on YouTube and in other places on the internet, videos that teach religious error, and we're going to examine them in the light of the Bible. And we want to say at the very beginning, it is not our intention to be combative. We are not trying to be ugly toward anyone. Our intention is simply to teach the truth. You know, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1 says that we are to test the spirits whether they are of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. John chapter 8 and verse 32, Jesus said, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And so, Aaron, this really becomes a heaven and hell issue, doesn't it? It does. You know, it's really important to get that out there at the beginning because Matthew 25, 46, in one of the judgment scenes, it talks about heaven and hell as being everlasting or eternal, and it uses the same word in Greek. So we have reached out, if anybody's curious, we've reached out to both of these men, um, and we really are hoping to just teach sound doctrine and hopefully take as many people to heaven as we can. And so this is a very serious, serious issue. We're, we're not trying to pick a fight with anyone. We're concerned not only about the souls of the people watching this program, but also about the souls of the people that are presenting this material. Now, the video that we're going to be examining today is one that we pulled from YouTube, where there are two different uh, denominational individuals, two men. They are discussing the topic of baptism, and particularly whether or not it is necessary for salvation. And they're going to argue that it is not necessary. And so what we're going to do is play the video. We're going to make some stops as we go, and we're going to examine the error in the light of the Scriptures. All right, let's begin the video. Do I have to be baptized to go to heaven? Mm. All right, do I have to be baptized to go to heaven? Let me just answer this this way, first of all. And I would ask you why you wouldn't want to be baptized if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It is something that all believers are commanded to do. In fact, it's one of the very first things we're commanded to do if we believe. A lot of folks who have never been baptized are willing to take communion all the time. And communion is something we corporately do as a sign that we have faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his provision through his broken body and shed blood. But they don't do the thing that he tells us to do if we uh, love God and want to be identified with his death, burial, and resurrection. And I don't know why you wouldn't want to be baptized if you love Jesus Christ, when it's the first thing that Scripture says that we should do as a sign that we believe. Okay, Aaron, let's uh, stop and discuss this for a minute. He asked the question, why would you not want to be baptized? He said, why wouldn't a person want to be baptized if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Now, here's my question. Can a person have a relationship with Jesus Christ without baptism? It's a great question. You know, in the book of Isaiah uh, 59, chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, it talks about how sin separates us from God. So if we want to have a, a relationship, a reconciled relationship with God, we have to have those sins remitted. Uh, so whenever we look in the New Testament, we see that a person's sins are not forgiven or remitted. Remission is used in Acts 2 and verse 38 uh, until we are baptized. Uh, and the reason for that is that's when we contact the blood of Christ. So right from the beginning, the blood of Christ is what washes away sins. Revelation 1, 5. And so a person needs to come in contact with that blood to have those sins forgiven. And then that relationship starts at that point in time. That's exactly right. In fact, listen to this. This is Romans chapter 6, beginning, beginning in verse number 3. It says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. That's where the relationship begins, when we're baptized into His death. Keep going. He says, Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. When do we get the new life? At the point of baptism. When do we contact the death of Christ? When we are baptized into His death. And so we begin that relationship with Jesus at the point of baptism. You know, it's also interesting in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3, John says, And hereby we do know that we know Him, 
if we keep His commandments. Sometimes I hear people say, I have a personal relationship with Jesus, and yet they argue it's not necessary to obey the commandment to be baptized. Mm -hmm. John says, you don't know the Lord if you don't keep His commandments. And so, very interesting point to begin with. And Romans 6 is such a powerful passage because later in that same chapter, you get to verse 17, but God be thanked that though you were slaves to sin, he's contrasting two relationships, he, he moves on and he says, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And verse 18, and having been set free from sin, the King James, I believe, says having then been set free from sin. So if someone says, well, that's spirit baptism, right? No, it's, it's the type of baptism that you obey. You hear the doctrine, the Holy Spirit uh, gave that doctrine, we have it in the New Testament, the inspired word through the, the apostles and other writers, and we have that doctrine here. We obey it today the same way they did 2,000 years ago. And when a person puts on Christ in baptism, those sins are washed away and they've been obedient to that form of doctrine that was delivered. Uh, that's right. All right, let's continue the video. However, if somebody wants to say, I've got to do anything to be saved other than acknowledge my sin and trust in God's provision for my sin in order for me to be saved, they are trifling with the gospel. All right, we've got to stop here. He says, if anyone says that I have to do anything, he says, other than acknowledge my sin and believe in God, he says that person is trifling with the gospel. What do you say to that? Well, we always want to let the Bible speak. That's our standard. That's our authority. Um, and, and so I've heard this before when people say there's nothing you must do. And when I hear that, uh, you want to be polite, but I go immediately in my mind to Acts chapter 9 and verse 6. Uh, Acts chapter 9 and verse 6, uh, Saul, who becomes the Apostle Paul, is on the road to Damascus and Jesus encounters him. And in Acts chapter 9 and verse 6, he, this is talking about Saul, trembling and astonished, said, and this is speaking to Jesus, Lord, what do you want me to do? And so he asks Jesus, what do you want me to do? If, if the man's saying is proper, Jesus just said nothing. There's nothing you must do. But notice Jesus says the exact opposite of that. Jesus himself, then the Lord said to him, to Saul, arise, go to the city, and you will be told what you must do. So Jesus himself tells Saul what he must do. And we see later in Acts 22, what he was told that he must do was to stop praying, which he'd been doing for three days, and to arise and be baptized and wash away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So Jesus says, you must do something. And in Ananias in Acts chapter 22, he comes and tells him what he must do, which is arise and be baptized to have his sins washed away. So this gentleman says that if a person says you have to do anything, you're trifling with the gospel. Mm -hmm. And yet that contradicts what we have in Acts chapter 9. In fact, there's a similar statement in Acts chapter 10, isn't That's there? That's exactly right. One chapter later, Acts chapter 10 and verse 6, where you have uh, the man coming to Cornelius, and he says something that you're going to be told words you must do. So that's Acts 10, 6. Um, Acts 2, 38, when the people came to Peter and said, what must we do? Men and brethren, what must we do? And Peter didn't say, say a sinner's prayer. He didn't say, do nothing. You already believe. They were believers. They were religious people at the day of Pentecost. And Peter says, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. So that's just three examples of the many that we could talk about all over the New Testament. In fact, I wrote down just a few passages to really drive this point home. Matthew 7, 21, this is a scene from the Judgment Day. Jesus says, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Matthew 25 and verse 21, also a judgment scene. The Lord says to the righteous, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. In the judgment scene in which the Lord separates mankind to his right hand and to his left hand, Matthew 25, 31, the Lord says to the righteous, You have done. Mm -hmm. To the unrighteous, he says, You did it not. Acts 10, 35, But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted of him. Now, what's the point of that? There's something you have to do. You have to work righteousness to be accepted of God. 1 John 3 and verse 7, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. 1 John 2, 17, And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. We could go on and on, but we want to make the passage... We, we want to make the point that he's contradicting exactly what the Bible says. He says if you say you have to do something, 
you're trifling with the gospel. I think sometimes people have a problem reconciling because we have to take Psalm 119, 160 says, the sum of thy word is truth. And so you see passages like Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we're saved by grace through faith, not of works. And somebody will say, well, that means if you do anything. And the fact is, just because we do something doesn't mean we earn it. I think back to Joshua chapter 6, verse 2 in the Old Testament, where God says to Joshua, I have given you Jericho. I've given you a city. Joshua then was told, you need to march around it. Right. The, Joshua didn't mark around, march around the city, the walls fall, and he says, look what I earned. That's you right. know, so there's a combination. God sets the terms. It's still all by grace. God is gracious to us. But yet, you look in, later in the book of Hebrews, and it says the walls of Jericho fell by faith. That's right. So it was still by faith, even though he was required to do something. And he didn't earn it. It was still a gift, but it and, required obedience. And that's always God's way, Old Testament and New Testament. That's right. Okay, let's keep rolling the video. Okay, let me give you just a couple of verses, and then we'll go and look at some scripture that that, um, you know, is relevant to the topic, okay? First of all, it might not surprise people, I'm going to quote Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace, grace is something you get when you don't deserve it. For by grace we are saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no man should boast. This is relevant because um, it would be true, Rick, right? If anybody went to heaven who wasn't baptized... We already know the answer to that question, right? Yep. So let's take a look at somebody who we believe is righteous, which is the term for uh, those that are saved and are going to be in relationship with God forever, who was not baptized, who is in fact in heaven. In fact, it says this guy has nothing to boast about. Why? Because he didn't do anything, including uh, get baptized, except believe, okay? His name is Abraham. Now, this is something that somebody's going to say, well, he's talking about an Old Testament guy. But let's look what it says right here in Romans chapter 4, verse 3. It says, uh, if Abraham, actually this is verse 2, if Abraham was justified by works, he's got something to boast about, okay? In Ephesians 2, it says, we don't have a right to boast because it's not as a result of our works. But it says, if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So Abraham didn't do anything, okay, except have faith in the covenant-keeping God, and God reckoned that to him as righteousness. And so almost everybody, I don't know anybody who doesn't believe that Abraham's in heaven. Okay, Aaron, there's a lot here. Mm -hmm. First, he says that Abraham didn't do anything, and he cites Romans chapter 4 and verse 2 that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now, how do you explain that? Is it really true that Abraham's righteousness was based on nothing but faith? Well, it's interesting. He, he quotes Romans 4.2. And now Romans 4.2 quotes a passage from the Old Testament from Genesis chapter 15, uh, verse 6. Uh, and then he says, one of the things is he says, Abraham didn't do anything. I think it's important to remember that's Genesis 15.6 that Romans 4.2 quotes. That's not Abraham's initial relationship with God. Right. Abraham's initial relationship with God started in uh, Genesis chapter 12, where if I flip back here, it says that God called, he told Abraham to go out into a land that he would show him, and Abraham obeyed that. Uh, Genesis 12.1, now the Lord said to Abraham, get out of your country from your family, and you can continue to read, verse 2, I'll make you a great nation, verse 3, and in all the families of the earth shall be blessed through you. Well, then I turn over to Genesis 22, and you find something out about Abraham's obedience. Now, Genesis 22.18, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Why? Because you did nothing? No, because you have obeyed my voice. And you go even to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8, I, don't, I won't flip there, but it says Abraham by faith obeyed. The idea that obedience leads, that, that it's faith. Faith is obedient. There, the, the word faith in Greek and belief, we have to be careful of the context. Sometimes it means just a simple belief. Oh, I believe that. Sometimes faith is referring to the gospel, the system of faith. And so connecting passages like Ephesians 2, 8, 9 say by grace, through faith, we got to be careful. That's the system of faith. That's the gospel. Right. Um, and also, Abraham was never commanded to, to be baptized. That was a different covenant. So Now, let me ask you this question. He cites Romans chapter 4 and verse 2 that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Oftentimes, people uh, like this gentleman will say, they, they will camp out in Romans chapter 4 mm -hmm. and say, Abraham was saved by faith, not works. Mm -hmm. And he'll say the context even specifically says, not works. And as you mentioned, the passage that is quoted by Paul in Romans chapter 4 is Genesis 15, 6. Mm -hmm. Now what is interesting, later in the New Testament, 
the, uh, in the book of James, chapter 2, James also quotes Genesis 15, 6. But James says this in James 2, 23. He says, You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Mm -hmm. And so you've got two different uh, books of the Bible that both quote Genesis 15, 6. Mm -hmm. In Romans, he quotes Genesis 15, 6 and says, not by works. Mm -hmm. James quotes Genesis 15, 6 and says, not without works. That's right. It almost sounds like James is contradicting Paul. How do you explain that? Well, it's interesting. The idea that James and Romans reconciling uh, Romans 4, 2 and James 2, 21 is one of the reasons that Martin Luther said, just throw the book of James out to straw epistle. Instead of thinking, well, if some works are required and some aren't, maybe there are different types of works. Uh, some people will try to say, oh, well, James 2 is talking about your faith before men. They'll say it's lateral. And Romans is talking about your faith before God. Well, that's not true because in James chapter 2 and verse 14, at the end of that sentence, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? It's talking about salvation. And in the, in the next few verses, it even references a similar situation to, you know, if you see one of uh, someone uh, that's naked and destitute of food and you say, be depart in peace, be warmed and filled. That's reminiscent of Matthew 25. You know, I was naked and you clothed me. Right. That's talking about eternal salvation. So they're both talking about salvation. The difference is James is talking about works that are in an obedient faith, right? And Romans talking about works of the law of Moses. Okay. If someone's watching, go read Romans 3. You see works of the law. That's the law of Moses. Okay, that's right. So you've got two different uh, New Testament authors citing Genesis 15, 6. Mm -hmm. One says, not by works, and the other says, not without works. That's right. But they're talking about two different types of works. That's exactly. One in Romans is mm -hmm. referencing works of the law of Moses and James is referencing works of obedience. Mm -hmm. And so exactly you can't right. go to Romans 4 then to say that you don't have to have works of obedience. No, you're exactly right. And the other big point he made in there was uh, speaking about Abraham. Right. Uh, Abraham lived under a different covenant, a different set of instructions from us. Right. And that's, uh, in the nicest way to say this, that's a very basic understanding of the Bible. Because if I didn't understand that the book of Genesis was not a covenant I lived under, then I might go out and try to build an ark like Noah did. Right. Th that wasn't given to me. Uh, there's a reason we don't offer animal sacrifices today because Jesus Christ fulfilled that and took it out of the way. Right. And so we need to look now for as Christians starting in Acts chapter 2, that's the new Christian covenant that we live under. So Abraham absolutely is in heaven. The New Testament even says sit down in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's we right. know that right now he's in paradise. Right. One day he'll be in heaven, but right. he lived under a different covenant. So right. yeah. Okay, let's continue the video. So there you go. It's possible to go to heaven and not be baptized. But people go, oh, Todd, 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 that's an Old Testament saint. You don't understand that they were saved differently in the Old Testament than the New. And I would say, you don't know your Bible. Now, he says, people will say to me, Todd, 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 you don't understand. People were saved differently in the Old Testament than in the New Testament. To which he would respond, you don't know your Bible. Now, of course, he's wrong about this. Mm -hmm. It is the case that people were saved differently in the Old Testament than in the New Testament. Abraham, of course, lived under the patriarchal system. In order to be saved under that system, there were animal sacrifices that they had to comply with. Ultimately, though, they were going to be washed by the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You come to the Mosaic system. They had 600 plus laws they had to comply with, but ultimately they were going to be justified by the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. In the New Testament, we have a different set of rules that we have to comply with, but we too are washed by the blood of Jesus. And so when he says, you don't understand, uh, he says, people say, Todd, 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 you don't understand that people were saved differently in the Old Testament than the New Testament, to which he says, you don't know your Bible. How would you respond to that statement? Well, I think it's clear to talk about, you know, you look at Hebrews chapter 11. Abraham was saved by faith. You can go through that whole. So every men have always been saved by faith, but that faith has always been obedient to the commands God gave them. Right. So when I look back in the, in the, uh, the book of Genesis, animal sacrifices were required in a certain way, where the, the father was acting as the priest of the family, uh, in a sense. Then you get to Deuteronomy 5, where it talks about the law of Moses was not given to the, Jew, the Jews there, it wasn't given to their fathers, but to them. Then you go to Hebrews 8, where it says, He has made the first covenant obsolete and brought in a new covenant. Right? So Hebrews 8.13, talking about the new Christian covenant. Mm -hmm. So there's a progression, and if we don't understand that, most of the Bible is going to really just be hard for us to understand. That's a, that's a basic Bible truth. You know, I, I think about 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, 
rightly dividing the word of truth, one of the first principles involved in a Bible student approaching the Word of God is that he has to be able to rightly divide the Word. That is, I need to know what was part of the Old Testament and what is part of the New Testament. And I need to know which part applies to me. I, I think you cited earlier about uh, building an ark. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't apply to me. If I went out and started gathering gopher wood to build an ark, I would not be rightly dividing the Word. And so mm -hmm. that's a first principle when it comes to understanding the Word of God. And so in, in uh, reference to this uh, present discussion, he's using Abraham as an example to prove that you don't have to be baptized today. Mm -hmm. Why is that a uh, faulty logic or faulty reasoning. Abraham wasn't baptized, therefore we don't have to be. Does that follow? No, because Abraham was never, number one, commanded to be baptized. Okay. You know, it's, it's interesting. Abraham's thousands of years ago, but if you move a little closer to the New Covenant, a lot of times people say the thief on the cross wasn't baptized. Right. And if you open up your Bible, if you go to Luke 23, right? That's where the thief on the cross, the story happens. Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. And Jesus meant that. Jesus was correct. The New Covenant still wasn't in effect. Right. So, so Someone says the thief on the cross wasn't commanded to be baptized. That command hadn't been given yet. If you look over in Luke chapter 24 and verse 47, Jesus, after his death, burial, and resurrection, so it's after the, the cross, the burial, resurrection, he says in verse 47, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So you put that beginning with Jerusalem with the Great Commission of Matthew 28 and Mark 16, which was after the resurrection. He says it will happen. It happened in Acts 2. So Acts 2 is when that new covenant started at Pentecost. Every person from that point forward has been required to hear the gospel, believe, comp uh, confess, repent, and be baptized. And that's what, that's what the new covenant entails. Don't you think this would maybe be a good comparison when he says Abraham wasn't baptized, therefore we don't have to be? What if I were to argue today George Washington did not pay federal income taxes, therefore I don't have to pay federal income taxes? Be parallel, wouldn't it? As much as I'd like to take that argument. Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> that's right. But of course that uh, would be faulty reasoning. That's right. Because George Washington lived under a different set of laws than I do today. The law to pay federal income tax was not applicable in the days of George Washington, therefore he did not pay. It's the exact same reasoning with Abraham. He lived under a different covenant and a different law. Mm -hmm. So to go back to him would be the same as me going back to George Washington. It's very faulty reasoning, and I think it's interesting that he argues people that say otherwise don't know their Bible. It seems to be making just the opposite point, and that is he's not rightly dividing the Word of God. Yeah, and like you said, we want to be polite, but at the same time we care about people's souls. And so the idea that every, every person has always been saved the same way, it's just not true. And that's so right. with respect, it's, it's just, that's not rightly dividing the word. That's right, that's right. Okay, let's continue the video. The righteous shall always live by faith. That's what Paul says in Romans just before this chapter, and uh, not by what we do. Okay, now let me say this, Titus 3.5, okay? And we are saved, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, it's the right thing to get baptized. Okay, but we're saved not on the deeds that we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of uh, regeneration, by the renewal of his spirit. Okay, and so um, there's nothing in the scripture that would seem to indicate there's anything that we do. Okay, uh, a couple of things I want to pull out here. Number one, he says, he, he's referencing the Apostle Paul. He says, Paul says that the righteous shall live by faith, and he emphasizes this, not by what we do. Is that what Paul said? No, I, I've read every single one of Paul's writings in the New Testament, and Paul never says that. Paul says the righteous will live by faith, but the, the thing he added on there, not by what we do, that's not in Scripture. Right. Uh, so now I understand that he may be paraphrasing a thought that he has, but that's not in Scripture. Right. Scripture over and over, like, I mean, just to go back to a good example, I think, is Jesus. <laughs> right. of, of all people, we're going to be judged by his words, John 12, 48. Right. So I'm going to trust Jesus. And he told Paul, Acts 9, 6, there's something you must do. Right. If that was the only verse in the Bible that said it, I would trust Jesus' words. But unfortunately, there's many other verses that say that it, does, it is important what we do. Yes. In fact, let me read this. Um, James chapter 2, beginning in verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made 
perfect. Now, we're emphasizing the fact that he is saying it's not by what you do. Mm -hmm. James is emphasizing there's faith involved in this, but what you do is important. Keep going. He says, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Now listen to verse 24. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. That's right. James is emphasizing the fact that faith is involved in this, but he says you can understand the process that you do have to do something. That's mm -hmm. the whole point of this mm -hmm. section, which is just the opposite of what this gentleman is saying. Well, it's so interesting when you compare passages, sometimes you have to reason through. You know, you just read James 2.21, that a man is justified by works, not by faith only, faith by itself. Well, I, I look over in a book like Galatians, different context. And it says in Galatians chapter 2, it talks about you are justified by faith, not, verse 16, a man is not justified by works of the law. That's right. talking about law of Moses. That's right. And I can prove that baptism has nothing to do with that because James two six, or, uh, Galatians 2.16, a man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus. So he says, not by works of the law, but you are justified by faith in Jesus. In the same context, look at Romans, or I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, he's talking about justification by faith, verse 24. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. He's talking about the gospel, justified by faith. Verse 26, for you are all sons of God through faith. In Christ Jesus, that's the location of salvation. It's in the uh, date of uh, the locative uh, case in Greek. Verse 27, for, that word's gar, that means because of. So it says, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, because for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So Paul says in chapter 2, not of works of the law of Moses. And then in chapter 3, you're justified by faith. When? When you were baptized. Right. Baptism is a part of justification by faith. Yes. It's just... It's easier to believe the lie you've heard a thousand times than the truth you've heard once. That's true. So people have been told baptism's a work, even though it's passive and somebody else does it to you. Right. So we just we have to try to really get the context right. Okay, the next thing he says in uh, this particular section is he references Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, which says, "...not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now, I want to break this down a little bit. Titus 3 and verse 5 says, not by works of righteousness. That means, of course, that uh, we don't earn it. We don't mm -hmm. deserve it. Mm -hmm. I will not go to heaven because I deserve to go. You will not go to heaven because you're so good God has to let you in. It's not by works of righteousness. I'm never going to earn it. Mm -hmm. But then he continues, but according to his mercy. If any of us are going to be saved, it's going to be because of God's mercy because He sent His Son. It's John 3.16, because God so, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. I can't earn it. I don't deserve to go. I have no means to go. But God was merciful and provided a way whereby I could go. And then it says, He saved us by the washing of regeneration. Now, what is that? I don't deserve to go. God provided a way mm -hmm. so that I could experience or be saved by the washing of regeneration. What is that a reference to? Well, that's baptism. I mean, it's interesting. You said something that's just so true and it's so important. We don't deserve the, the, even the, the offer of salvation. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Wage is what I deserve. The first, when I come into my first sin, God is holy. I can't be in His presence. So what I deserved was death. But what God did is He sent His Son, John 3.16. He loved the world. So He sent Him to, to be that propitiation, that perfect propitiation for our sins, to satisfy that so God can be just and the justifier, as Romans talks about. And so the second part of Romans 6.23, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So we have to find out how to get in Christ Jesus. And once we do that, then we have been washed. Uh, washing and regeneration here, the New Testament, Acts 22, 16, sins washed away. Revelation 1, 5, sins washed by the blood. Um, so it's talking about baptism. Right. Uh, and, and sometimes these, you have to study these a little bit to understand it. But you, know, you compare that with some other passages in the New Testament, and it, it gets a lot clearer. In fact, we have put together a chart here for Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 since he uh, references this. I want you to look at this chart with us. This is Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 explained by examining some other passages. Now, if you look at the left side of the chart, you see Titus 3 and verse 5, Ephesians 5, 26, and John 3 and verse 5. These are parallel passages. I want you to notice that Titus 3 mentions being saved. 
Ephesians 5 mentions being cleansed, and John 3 mentions entering the kingdom. Now, being saved, being cleansed, that's being cleansed of sins, of course, mm -hmm. and entering the kingdom, all of these things happen at the same time. Mm -hmm. A person enters the kingdom when he's saved. He is saved when he's cleansed of his sins. Now, I also want you to notice in the next column that there are two things that are required in each of these passages. In order to be saved, he says you have to have the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. In order to be cleansed, you have to have the washing of water and you have to have the Word. And then in order to enter the kingdom, there are two things. You have to be born of the water and you have to be born of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. All of these are parallel with one another. Now, mm -hmm. I particularly want us to uh, look at the blue section here on the chart. That is the top one. Titus chapter 3 says that we have to have the washing of regeneration. Ephesians 5 says we have to have the washing of water. Mm -hmm. And then John 3 says we have to be born of the water. All of these mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. Washing of regeneration, washing of water, born of the water. What is this talking about? This salvation, this cleansing, that which adds us to the kingdom, this washing, what is this a reference to? It's a reference to baptism. You add those three. I even think of Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, He said He's going to build His church and He's going to give the keys to the kingdom. So He says the church and the kingdom. Well, then I go to Acts. You just talked about you know, uh, John 3, 3 through 5, added to the kingdom. Well, in Acts chapter 2, when Peter you know, figuratively took those keys, opened up the kingdom, He said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. In verse 47, they were added to their number, added to the church. Right. So it's really, uh, you see that over and over and over in the New Testament. And it's really exciting the more you study to see how all these passages really fit together. Yeah. And it's important to do that because if you don't let the text speak and you put your own preconceived ideas in, it takes the joy out of learning because yeah. you can't reconcile a lot of these passages. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's continue the video here. Uh, there is therefore now no condemnation, Romans 8, 1 says, for those who are in Christ Jesus doesn't say who are in Christ Jesus and who are baptized. He says, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And he cites Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And he says, it doesn't add and who have been baptized. He says, you have to be in Christ Jesus, but it doesn't say that you have to have been baptized. Mm -hmm. Now, my question would be this. How does a person get into Christ Jesus? Well, it's ironic that's Romans 8. And so if you go two chapters earlier, remember, number one, the letter to the Romans is written to the Roman church. They're all Christians already. That's right. So if you look at the book of Acts, they've already been baptized, okay? So if you go two chapters earlier to Romans chapter 6, how do they get into Christ? Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. He's saying in verse 2, How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Guys, you should have died to sin already. And he calls them back to when they died to sin, verse 3. Or do you not know as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. So those in Christ of Romans 8, 1 are the same in chapter 6 that got into Christ when they were baptized. That's right. So there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ. That's, yeah, right. that's right. So what he's saying is to those of you who have already been baptized and therefore are in Christ, mm -hmm. there is no condemnation. Mm -hmm. And so his argument really makes no sense in yeah. light of what's stated in chapter 6. Yeah, and Romans 6 is not the only place. Galatians 3 talks about that. We covered that earlier, but you know, you're all sons of God by faith. How? For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So Galatians 3, in the context of justification by faith, you were baptized into Christ. Romans, justification by faith, chapter 6, you were baptized into Christ. Okay. Yeah. All, right. All right. Let's continue the video. Uh, it says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Let's stop there. He says that we are justified by faith through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, he's correct mm -hmm. that we are justified by faith. Mm -hmm. The question is, how are we justified by faith? When are we justified by faith? You know, one of the things that uh, he does over and over and over is he takes a verse that mentions faith and he pretends that it says faith only, mm -hmm. and that's not the case. Mm -hmm. So, how do you respond to this? It really boils down to a difference in the definition of faith. Every time he sees faith, he thinks belief alone. That's right. it. Whereas the Bible uses faith sometimes as belief, sometimes as the system. But I want to read a verse. Maybe this will clear something up. He's basically making the assertion that if you believe, 
in Jesus, you're saved automatically. Nothing you have to do afterwards. Well, if I can show some people who believed in Jesus but stopped there and weren't saved, I think that's, that's important to note. It'll show that when we're justified by faith, it's justified by the gospel, the, full, the fullness of that. John chapter 12 and verse 42, I'm sure you already know where I'm going, you're flipping. John 12, 42, nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. Believed in who? That's Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. So these people believed in Jesus, but they stopped there. According to the doctrine of faith alone, belief alone, they're saved, but we see that they're not from the text. Right. So whenever you quote a passage justified by faith, that's exactly right. And once again, Galatians 3, 24 and 27, write that down for justifications by faith, because justification by faith Paul, the same writer of Romans, says baptism is a part of that. It's obedient faith that obeys God's commands. That's right. Every passage that says that we're saved by faith, we believe that. The mm -hmm. Bible teaches that we are saved by faith. Mm -hmm. But James 2.26 says that faith without works is dead. Your faith has to be active. Your faith has to do something. Mm -hmm. In fact, we could say it this way. We are saved by faith. We are saved by grace. But our faith has to do something to access the grace of God. Mm -hmm. Titus 2 and verse 11 says that the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, but not all men are going to be saved. Mm -hmm. Your faith has to do something so that you can access that grace. Mm -hmm. And it, you brought up Titus 2.11. It says the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. And then the very next verse, verse 12, starts out instructing us. God's grace gave us the gospel. It appeared to all men if it was you know, by grace alone, all men would be saved according to that verse. So right. yeah, it, it brought us the plan of salvation and instructs us. Okay, all right, let's continue the video. Uh, Paul, one of the greatest evangelists who ever lived, okay? Um, when he went and uh, spent some time in Corinth, evangelizing and sharing the gospel with the people that are in Corinth, he even goes so far as to say to them, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you other than Crispus and Gaius, okay? Why would Paul be glad to baptize people if they need to be baptized to go to heaven? One of the arguments he's making to say that baptism is not necessary for salvation mm -hmm. is that he says Paul did not baptize and Paul was happy that he did not baptize. Mm -hmm. and, and he's arguing it's because baptism is not necessary mm -hmm. for the remission of sins. Mm -hmm. Is that why Paul was... Uh, uh, making this statement. Well, no, if you look at the context of chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, he's dealing with problems in the church. And you can read through that on your own. Ch uh, verse 10, he basically says, you guys are following after men. You're saying, I follow Paul, I follow Cephas, I follow Apollos. And Paul's saying, stop it. You're supposed to follow Christ. Right. And, you know, if you look at the very beginning of 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2, to the church of God, it's already written to Christians, which is at Corinth, Background, Acts 18, 8, they were baptized. To those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. We've already explained earlier that calling on the name of the Lord, if you let the Bible define it, is not a prayer. It is baptism. So everyone this letter is written to has already been baptized. Paul is saying, stop acting like children. You're not following Christ. Christ was not crucified for you. Christ, you weren't baptized in his name. It's interesting he mentions the crucifixion and baptism as the two things that cause them to be owned by Christ. Right. And, uh, and I'll let you add to that, but you, know, you look in, in verse uh, 17. Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. The primary job of an apostle was to preach not to baptize. Anybody can baptize. You look back when Jesus' ministry in the book of John, uh, I think I have it written down here, the beginning, John chapter 4 and verse 2, when the Lord knew the Pharisees had heard, Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples. Why? Because I think there's possibility someone saying, well, Jesus baptized me, I'm better than you. Right. No, the, the importance was preaching the gospel and they were following after men. You know, one of the things that we oftentimes say is, it is easy for a person to take a verse out of context and mm -hmm. teach something. Mm -hmm. And usually the answer to error is found right in the context. Mm -hmm. So he makes the argument here that Paul says that a baptism is not necessary for salvation. Let's actually read the context and see what Paul says, because Paul tells us the reason here. In mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 11, Paul says, For it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? 
Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. What's the reason, Paul? Look what he says in verse 15. Lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. The point that Paul is making is there's division in the church. Some people were saying, well, I'm a Christian, but I follow Paulus. I'm a Christian, but I follow Cephas. Mm -hmm. And Paul then says, I'm thankful I didn't baptize very many of you because it would have just uh, aggravated the problem. You would, I'd, have, I'd have more people trying to hold to me. That's what Paul says. And so his assertion is a made-up assertion mm -hmm. that is not what the text says and actually contradicts what Paul says. This text nowhere says that baptism is not necessary. And that would also put Paul at odds with what he taught in Galatians. That's right. With what Jesus taught, what Peter taught. With, in Acts chapter 8, it says that Philip preached Jesus. In the next verse, he says, hey, here's water. Right. What hinders me from being baptized? So we know that preaching Jesus includes baptism if we let the Bible speak. Right. Okay, let's continue. All right, John chapter 3, verse 18, uh, it says, He who believes in him, talking about Jesus, is not judged. It doesn't say he who believes in him and is baptized is not judged, but it says he who does not believe in Jesus has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Okay, in this particular segment, he cites John chapter 3 and verse 18, and he says that uh, it is stated, he who believes in Jesus is not judged. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say, he who believes and is uh, baptized mm -hmm. is not judged. Mm -hmm. And so he makes a lot of these arguments based on what the text does not mm -hmm. say mm -hmm. rather than what the text does say. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to this argument? John 3, 18, he who believes in Jesus is not judged. Well. First of all, you're John 3, 18. Like you said earlier, look at the context. Uh, you look back at John 3, 3 through 5. The, the context, as one of my favorite preachers says, is soaking wet. Okay? Right. He just got done talking about how you must be baptized to right. enter the kingdom. And then 13 verses later, he who believes. Now, does that mean Jesus forgot about what he just said? Right. That's one thing. Two things. If you have a King James or a 1901 ASV, the first three words are a little more clear. He who believeth. It says believes in the New King James. He who believeth, that's a present uh, participle, present tense, which means it's continuing, right? It's conditional on the fact that you believe and you keep believing, all right? It is not condemned. He who keeps believing, present tense, is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name. So it's not just belief once and I'm done. It's continuing to believe, and that would include believing the baptism he talked about 13 verses earlier in John 3, 5. You know, it's also interesting in this same context, he's citing John 3, 18. Mm -hmm. If you go down to John 3, 36, about what's that, 18 verses later, mm -hmm. the text says this, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, mm -hmm. but the wrath of God abideth on him. Mm -hmm. I want you to notice this, that there are two words, believeth, that appears two times. Mm -hmm. He that believeth hath everlasting life, he that believeth not shall not see life. Now, in the English, in the King James, these are the same word. Mm -hmm. In the Greek, this is actually two different words. Mm -hmm. The second word carries with it the idea of obedience. In fact, a number of different uh, versions mm -hmm. translate it that way. The uh, Old American Standard says this, He that believeth on the Son hath eternal life, but he that obeyeth not the Son mm -hmm. shall not see life. Mm -hmm. The New American Standard, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son shall not see life. And so what is that verse teaching us? It is teaching us that it is an obedient faith that saves. A person who believes but does not obey shall not see life. So the context of John chapter 3, he tells us in the early part mm -hmm. that a person must be born of the water and the Spirit. That is, mm -hmm. he must be baptized in compliance with the teaching of the Spirit. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. You must continue to believe. And then you get to verse 36 and he says, you have to believe and obey. Mm -hmm. If you believe and you don't obey, you will not be saved eternally. That's exactly right. So, That's great. All right, let, let's continue then. Okay, John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God. Okay, even to those who believed in his name. I mean, I'm just giving you verse after verse after verse. All right, uh, he says, I'm giving you verse after verse mm -hmm. after verse to prove my point as if he's giving an abundance of Scripture mm -hmm. that says what he's asserting. And he cites specifically John chapter 1 and verse 12 as a proof verse mm -hmm. to say that you do not have to be baptized, you only have to believe. Mm -hmm. John 1 and verse 12 says, but as many as received him, 
to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Mm -hmm. What's the answer to this error? Well, let, let's read the verse because it, the verse is actually fairly clear and actually in the opposite position that He holds. Um, but as many as received Him, to them, those who received Him, he gave the right to become children of God. When I moved to Mississippi, I got the right to get a Mississippi driver's license. I didn't get it automatically as soon as I moved. And so it says he gave the right to become. So they believed they weren't children yet. And once again, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, it says, when did they become sons? When did they become children of God? Galatians 3, for you are all sons of God, children of God through faith. How? as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Okay. When someone was baptized, they became a child of God. So the truth is, to those who believe, if they will follow through in obedience, then they can become sons of God. That's Absolutely. what he's saying. Absolutely. All right. He says that he's given us verse after verse after verse, but the fact is he hasn't given us any verses that say faith only. He's given us some verses that say faith. Mm -hmm. We agree with that. He's given some examples of people who live prior to the Great Commission, mm -hmm. prior to the New Testament system, but He hasn't given us any examples that teach faith only. Yeah. And that's what He's asserting, but He hasn't done it. That's right. All right, let's roll the video. There are a few people that when they're asked when they ask Paul or Peter the question, what must I do to be saved? They might hear, believe and be baptized. Okay? Well, that is a right and natural outflow of belief. But if you take a couple of verses and, and you make them um, prescriptive for what everybody must do, when there's an overwhelming amount of revelation that talk about the fact that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Okay, he says that there are few people who ask Peter and Paul, what must I do to be saved? And they're told to believe and be baptized. And he, then he says, of course, uh, being baptized is, is a natural outflow of belief. And of course, uh, that is true. Um, but he says there's an overwhelming amount of evidence that says all you have to do is believe. And then he downplays uh, the fact that you know, there's a few people that asked Peter and Paul what they had to do and they were told believe and be baptized. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that? Well, he said a few people. Number one, Jesus Christ, the, the Son of God, God in the flesh, said that not, he, all, he also said a few people, right? So we have Jesus who taught right. baptism for the remission of sins, Peter and Paul. Right. If I had to pick three very prominent Bible characters, those would be my guys. Right. All three of them taught not what he teaches, but that baptism is the point where you contact the blood of Christ. He also said that it's, it is uh, not prescriptive for all people. The Great Commission, Jesus Christ said, Matthew, I'll read in uh, chapter 16, verse 15. He said to them, how many people should you go to and preach this? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So this isn't just for a few people. It's prescriptive for every creature, every person from the time of Acts chapter 2 until now. So to say a few people, uh, those few people are Jesus, Peter, and Paul. That's right. So that's sort of downplaying our Lord um, a little bit. So you've got the Lord. His apostles inspired by the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and they said this, and the command was to teach this to all mm -hmm. of mankind. That's right. All right. You know, it's interesting. Uh, we've got a, a chart here I want to share with the viewers uh, dealing with the subject of baptism, because sometimes people will say, well, you know, people are always told to believe, but, you know, baptism's a, a rare thing. In fact, he makes it sound that way. He says we have an overwhelming amount of revelation that says we're saved by grace and faith alone. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as baptism, uh, you know, there's just a few of those. Uh, I want you to look at this chart that we have on the screen here. If you look across the top, you see the things that a person has to do to be saved. We have preaching, belief, repentance, confession, and baptism. If you look down the left-hand side, we've got a number of different uh, conversion accounts from the book of Acts. The, the book of Acts is when the church began. Uh, in fact, sometimes the book of Acts is called the book of conversions. And so we see a, a list, I think there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different accounts here. Now, if you look at the people on the day of Pentecost, if you look at the steps they went through, it's implied that they believed, they repented, confession is not mentioned, but they were baptized, that is mentioned. The people of Samaria in Acts chapter 8 and verse 5, they believed, repentance is not mentioned, confession is not mentioned, baptism is mentioned. The Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8, uh, 35 through 39, he was taught and believed. Repentance is not mentioned. Confession is mentioned. Baptism is mentioned. You keep going with Saul. You've got belief and repentance and confession implied. 
but you've got uh, baptism specifically mentioned, Acts 9 and verse 18. Cornelius, you've got baptism commanded. Lydia, you've got uh, baptism specifically mentioned in Acts 16 and verse 15. The jailer, the Philippian jailer in Acts 16 was baptized, verse 33. The Corinthians, Acts 18, were baptized. The Ephesians are baptized. Now, not all of the steps of the plan of salvation are mentioned every time, but in all of these cases, baptism is specifically mentioned. Everyone in the New Testament did the same thing in order to have their sins washed away, in order to become a part of the kingdom, in order to be washed by the blood of Jesus, and that involved being baptized. So he makes it sound like this is a rare thing, mm -hmm. but the truth is, when you study the Bible, it consistently took place. That's exactly right. And you know, the book of Acts tells us about the foundation of the church and how to become a Christian. The books of Romans through Revelation are letters written to people who are already Christians. So if you go to the, the books of Romans through Revelation to look for a plan of salvation, you will always see them point back to their baptism. It's never saying, hey, now that you're a Christian, you need to be baptized. You never see that. Right. So the book of Acts is where you need to look on how to become a Christian. That's right. That's right. Okay, let's continue. Okay, so John, the disciple that Jesus loves, said this, and this is the testimony, okay, uh, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in the Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son does not have the life. These things I have written to you who believe in order that you might know that you have eternal life. Okay, he references uh, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 11 that says this life is in His Son. I'm not really sure why he's citing this verse to uh, put forth the idea of faith only mm -hmm. because this verse does not uh, even seem to imply that to me. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I like this verse. I think it yeah. makes the case that we're making that the Bible teaches uh, that eternal life is found in His Son. Right. Now why is that significant? Well, because as we've, as we've covered a couple of times, that you get into Christ, you're baptized into Christ, Romans 6, 3, Galatians 3, 24 through 27. So uh, the idea that his eternal life is in His Son, I, I love that verse. You yeah, know, it's, yeah. it's exactly right. So uh, there's really not even anything I don't think to refute. You get into Christ when you're baptized into Christ. That's right. If you read the, this passage, 1 John 5, 11 says, eternal life is in His Son. Mm -hmm. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 10 says that salvation is in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, if I learn that salvation is in Christ Jesus and eternal life is in His Son, in Christ, mm -hmm. the question that I want to know is how do I get into Christ? Mm -hmm. And again, we go back to Romans 6 and verse 3, Know ye not that so many of you as were baptized into Jesus Christ were mm -hmm. baptized into His death. And so this is actually a great verse mm -hmm. to show the necessity of baptism. That's right. All right, let's continue. And so there is nothing in the Scripture that when you look at the revelation of God that would indicate that anything that we do, and baptism is something that we do, okay, it, uh, that would allow us to be saved. As there is nothing in the Scripture that would indicate that, that there is anything that we must do. Then he says baptism is something that we must do. Now, put this together. There is nothing that we must do. Baptism is something that we must do. So he says, you don't have to be baptized. Mm -hmm. What do you say? Well, the Holy Spirit speaking through Peter in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, this should be a good way to get the, que the answer to this question because somebody asked a Holy Spirit inspired apostle. Verse 37, when they heard this, Acts chapter 2 verse 37, if someone's reading along, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, all the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So what's their answer? It's 2,000 years old. If someone preaches something different than these guys preached, then it's another gospel. Verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for, and that's a different Greek word than we talked about earlier, that is ace, like a card, playing card, ace, for, in order to obtain the remission of sins. So Peter didn't answer, there's nothing you must do. And someone says, well, why would baptism save me? 1 Peter 3.21 is an interesting verse. There is an antitype which now saves us, Baptism. Why does baptism save us? It's not the water, not the removal of the filth of flesh, but your appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ is what saves us. It washes our sins away, but we have to contact that blood where Christ put it, and that is in the waters of baptism. That's I'm right. baptized in water physically. I'm contacting the blood of Christ spiritually. The only reason there's power in, in the waters of baptism is because God put it there. He says there is nothing in Scripture that would indicate there's anything we must do. 
But again, Matthew 7, 21, on the day of judgment, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. The, the indication of that is on the day of judgment, there will be some people who thought they were saved, but they did not do anything. Yeah. And he's going to say to those people, you are lost. Yeah. That's very sad. That's haunting. That's, it, why, it really we, that's why we do this program. All right, let's, uh, let's do this final segment. All right, so um, I don't know why you wouldn't be baptized, Rick, but it is an assault, an affront to the gospel to say that you must do something other than believe in Jesus to be reconciled to him. This is actually a very disturbing statement to mm -hmm. me. He mm -hmm. says that if a person says you must do something other than believe, mm -hmm. he says that is an assault and an affront mm -hmm. to the gospel. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that? With as much respect as I can say this, the gospel that he's preaching is another gospel. Right. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, I marvel you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. There's only one gospel. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Galatians, right after Paul says this, he says they became justified by faith, sons of God, at the point they were baptized and contact the blood of Christ. So it's simply, it's another gospel. Yeah. That's right. When he says, if you say that you have to do something other than believe, that is an assault to the gospel. Mm -hmm. Now, we're about to run out of time, but mm -hmm. I want to close with the words of Jesus. Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Now, based on his statement, that would be an assault and affront to the gospel. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And that is Jesus, just like telling Paul in Acts 9, 6, what each of us must do. Right. Dear friend, we're very thankful that you've joined us today for answering the error. It is our goal and our intention to teach only what the Bible teaches and to bring people to the knowledge of salvation. Baptism for the remission of sins is something that is necessary to be washed in the blood of Jesus and to be added to the Lord's kingdom. If you have questions about today's program, we hope that you'll write to us or call us or email us. Reach out in any way possible. We hope that you will join us again next time for Answering the Error.